Um, thank you, everybody. And um, um, let me just let me jump right to getting started. Um, We're incredibly fortunate today uh, to have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Sokobi Wilson, who will provide a talk entitled Environmental Racism and Injustice in the 21st Century, the Role of Community-Engaged Science for a Greener, More Equitable Future. The title of his talk gives you a sense of the breadth of themes in the EJ movement. It's a big house with many rooms. Dr. Wilson has brought his own perspective, training, and skills to environmental justice research and to the movements of the communities with which he works. Uh, Dr. Sokobi Wilson is Associate Professor with Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health and the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Maryland College Park School of Public Health, where he directs the Community Engagement, Environmental Justice, and Health Laboratory. He serves as Editor-in-Chief of the journal Environmental Justice. He's past chair of the American Public Health Association's Environment Section. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology, and a member of the US EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. His trainings in environmental health sciences and engineering, and throughout his career, he's been engaged in environmental justice and community-engaged research. He has worked on environmental racism projects with communities in the South, particularly in North and South Carolina. And since moving to the Washington DC area to working with communities along Maryland's Eastern shore, those who use the Anacostia River and the Chesapeake Bay. His work has addressed issues of water quality, air pollution, industrial animal production, climate change and community resilience. We share some close friends and comrades engaged in environmental justice struggles in the South. And those experiences I can say I count as some of the most formative of my life. It's an honor and a privilege for me to say, uh, welcome Dr. Sokobi Wilson, and uh, welcome to Irvine and for uh, the opportunity to hear you speak. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, happy to be here today and good to see uh, Dr. Richardson. Um, we've known each other for a long time, but with our ties uh, to UNC Chapel Hill. And so today um, I'm going to talk about, you know, as Dr. Richardson talked about, you know, gave you the environmental justice, gave you kind of a broad brush of environmental justice, environmental racism, and, and why those issues are important. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, get it in slides. And so, so I am a but also hear from uh, you know, scientists who do justice work. Uh, I'm, I'm a scholar activist. I'm a scholar advocate, right? I grew up in a community with EJ issues. Uh, you can say that. I mean, I live near a highway. I live near a sewer ship plant. I, near, I live near a landfill. So that, that is, that's a, informed like my lens and in, in work and in, in why I do the work that I do, right? And so when you think about, you know, the work that I do, and Dr. Richardson mentioned that you're talking about environmental racism, you know, you, you can't talk about, you know, uh, um, addressing health issues, uh, injustices in this country, I'll talk about racism. Racism in America, regardless of what people say in this whole critical race theory th stuff, I'm like, whatever, man, do that. I'm going to keep talking about environmental racism. And I actually have stronger terms than environmental racism. So that's not going to stop me from telling the truth and speaking truth to power. But racism in America, as, as American as apple pie, racism is making the walls of our country. You know, racism is a public health issue. For those of you who may, uh, who are in public health, you look at the work of Kawachi or Krieger, look at the work of David Williams, uh, look at the work of the, the scholars of social terms of health, right? Racism is a social term of health. Racism kills, okay? Racism, because of racism, yes, some communities are overburdened by, by environmental hazards, right? Who, who, who are overburdened by poor air quality, and it kind of, this, this thing called SARS, SARS CoV 2 found them as easy targets. Well, of course, they'd be easy targets when you live in communities that are air quality hotspots. And of course, you have decreased lung function, uh, increased cardiopulmonary functioning. You're an easy target for that virus, right? Racism kills. You know, think about, you know, the old Jim Crow, the new Jim Crow. You know, you think about the EJ movement. Dr. King, in his work uh, with the, the Memphis Sensation Worker Strike, I, I like to call Dr. King the grandfather of the EJ movement. 
because he was talking about issues of labor, how men were being treated, you know, the exposures on the job. And you're seeing one man, black man, came around and said, I'm a man. He said, recognize my humanity, right? What, what, why did I say that? In verbal injustice is dehumanization. I mean, you think about not just dehumanization, the, the criminalization of certain, certain communities, you know, how they're treated. So you, you can look at multiple issues. And it's, and again, racism in its various forms, right? Over policing, over sentencing, uh, school to prison pipeline. Uh, reproductive justice issues, um, how how cultural cultural rights in our indigenous brothers and sisters, um, this whole going back to think about black folks, uh, uh, black faces, white spaces, the whole you know with bird watching while black, couponing while black, Starbucks while black, walking down the street while black, buying skittles while black, you know in your own house eating ice cream while black, playing video games while black, babysitting while black taking subways to your house while black, backing your car up into your own backyard while black, wearing headphones, minding your own business in Colorado while black. Uh, Y'all know these stories. You know the names. Um, the people, George Floyd, Sandra Bland, so many other names that you we keep seeing people being killed by the police, uh, be, dying. This is all dehumanization, um, criminalization because of skin color, because of someone's uh, racial ethnic makeup, right? So you think about environmental justice, it's a movement fighting against this, right? Fighting against being used as a, how some communities use as a sacrifice song, fighting against the toxic trauma that those communities experience. So environmental justice is about where we live, where we work, where we play, where we pray, where we learn. It, it's a social movement. It's really, in many ways, is the, you know, the child of the civil rights movement. It's a continuation of the civil rights movement. It's the new civil rights movement to fight against the new Jim Crow. Some of you know the history of the movement. You know, North Carolina, there's many, there's probably other examples of EJ getting, you know, bubbling up. But it got his national attention with the PCB landfill fight in Warren County. You saw folks like uh, 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 Reverend Dr. Benjamin Chambers uh, fighting against this uh, PCB landfill being cited in North Carolina. It was cited uh, and it leaked. It was cleaned up, but EJ got his national attention with that, with this fight. You look at Dr., the work of Dr. Robert Buller in, in Texas with the, uh, his landfill studies, found in Houston that most of the landfills, regardless of income, were placed apart in black communities. So, so wealthy black communities, middle income black communities, low, low income black communities, they were being dumped on by landfills. So you think about environmental justice, you know, y'all learned this already in your classes probably. Different burden of hazards from chemical plants, petrochemical operations. Uh, you, you think about factories, landfills, incinerators, uh, sewage treatment plants, uh, any pollution, pollution intensive uh, uh, operations. Uh, industrial hog farms in North Carolina, uh, Iowa, industrial chicken farms in, in, in Delmarva Peninsula, you know, Delaware, uh, Maryland, Virginia. Highways and byways. I mean, think about, you, you learn, you probably heard in the news about this whole fight about, you know, Highways being racist. And what is Secretary Buttigieg talking about with highways being racist? Well, if you know your history in America, right? You know, uh, you know the history of racism in this country and how racism is embedded in how we zone plan and develop. Racism is embedded in our transportation policies. Look at the National, the National Highway Defense Act. Highways and byways were built on purpose to black and brown communities to displace, destroy those communities. It was policy. You look at housing and redlining. That was policy. So you want to understand why some communities, how segregation plays a role in concentrating, uh, you know, environmental risk, economic risk, social risk, economic segregation, housing segregation. That's a driver of environmental increased conditions of environmental justice. So again, inequities in planning, zoning, development have caused environmental injustice. First definition is the EPA's definition. I call it the kumbaya definition. Um, it's like the all lives matter definition. All lives matter, of course all lives matter, but what I'm saying is this definition, black lives matter too. What we're saying is that we know the law has not been equally applied to all communities. We know that the Clean Air Act doesn't protect all communities. If it did, we wouldn't have the COVID-19 disparities. We know that the Clean Water Act doesn't protect all communities. We know that the Safe Drinking Water Act doesn't protect all communities equally. 
And it doesn't take into account the issue of racism. The second definition is a definition that was coined by uh, Bunyan Bryant, a professor of at the University of Michigan uh, School of Natural Resources, now it's the School of Environment and uh, Sustainability. I, I may be messing it up. Uh, but for those of you in public health, or know about public health, this is a social determinants definition. You see, uh, realize your feelings of potential experience the isms. Decent paying and safe jobs, quality schools, quality recreation, decent housing, adequate health care. Those are all social determinants of health. So instead of the environmental justice movement, it's holistic. It's, again, it's about where you live, where you work, where you play, where you pray, where you learn. That's what you see in this definition. Communities free of violence, drugs, drugs and poverty. Justice prevails. Distributive justice prevails. We want to have procedural justice too. Restorative justice should, should prevail as well. Environmental racism, term that was coined by um, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Benjamin Chavis in the fight in, in, in Warren County. Intentional sighting, it says unintentional, but intentional sighting uh, of hazards based on race, um, lack of representation on boards in the decision making process. You also have environmental classism, which is intentional sighting based on uh, someone's you know, income or class. But when you look at toxic waste and race, and you had the follow up report in 2007. Toxic Race and Race 1987 was one of the first reports that showed that race is the most significant predictor of where hazardous uh, waste locations are, right? Where things are located, right? And so class is important, but race is a dominant factor. You heard me mention about the landfill fight, the landfill studies in Texas. Regardless of income, those lands were primarily put in black communities. You see that time and time again. Regardless of income, these facilities are put in people of color communities. Dr. Dixon, one of the first books written on it. So you saw the same photo, uh, one of Dr. Bullock's first books. He's, he says he, all of his books are just uh, chapters in the same book. But you see people who were, you know, fighting against uh, uh, these landfills. And so, you know, whether it be, again, landfills in rural North Carolina, uh, landfills in rural Alabama, which I'll get to later on the slides, Again, the first leg of my EJ stool is this traditional framing of environmental justice. So toxic release inventory facilities. Uh, you can look at the fossil, fossil fuel infrastructure, right? And of the continuum, let me say it that way. So whether it be extraction of fossil fuels, uh, well pass, uh, oil and gas wells, think about those in LA. Uh, you, you look at uh, um, transport of fossil fuels pipelines. Um, you look at refining the fossil fuels, refineries in Richmond, California, uh, Cancer Alley, Houston Ship Channel, burning the fossil fuels, coal at power plants, gas at power plants, uh, cars, commuting vehicles, uh, jerry's trucks, big trucks, buses, and waste products. The communities that are disproportionately impacted in all, all parts of the continuum are primarily communities of color and low wealth communities. Second leg was EJ stool. Those communities are overburdened, have a high concentration of psychosocial stressors. And the third leg of the EJ stool is, you know, what um, Antonovsky talks about salutogenesis, uh, promoting health, wellness, well being across all the the environment the, the political environment, the economic environment, the social environment, the built environment, right? Uh, the natural environment and the spiritual environment. So some communities have limited access or no access to salutogenic health promoting infrastructure. So there's a nature gap. There's a report that came out, I believe, last year that uh, people of color have uh, three times less access to nature compared to white counterparts. Uh, uh, low income folks have three times uh, 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 less access to nature compared to their wealthier counterparts. So folks don't have the access to, the, uh, to, to ecosystems to get access to those ecologic goods and service, services. So how are we gonna have a greater future if you got racism and, and discrimination, environmental discrimination, leading to differential access to ecological uh, resources, ecological goods, uh, to trees, uh, tree canopy, to green space, to clean rivers and streams. Everyone should benefit from those things. Unequal access to food infrastructure, unequal access to housing infrastructure. 
So when you think about environmental justice, folks have, instead of having access to just housing, they have unjust housing. Access to just food, they have unjust food. Instead of access to just transportation, they have unjust transportation. Instead of access to just healthcare, they have unjust healthcare. Instead of have access to just Wi-Fi, never heard that before, I'll say first time you're probably hearing it, they have unjust Wi-Fi, right? The digital divide, the cyber divide. So inequities in access to infrastructure, maybe the infrastructure bill will help with this. But we know if you go back to the Flint water crisis, there's money in the infrastructure bill to address, you know, uh, lead uh, lines and replace lead lines. And water is a huge EJ issue, right? Uh, for indigenous populations, our agricultural workers, for many of our urban communities. But that bill, I don't think, does a good job of covering water infrastructure for people who live in rural communities. Folks are on well water and septic tanks. You know that the Safe Drinking Water Act doesn't protect you if you're on an on individual well. So, I'm not sure that bill actually has dollars in it, and y'all can look up the bill, get us the, the, the new infrastructure bill. But I don't think it's talking about expanding access to potable water infrastructure for folks in rural communities. The lack of basic amenities is a huge EJ issue. The lack of access to clean water, to clean air, but going back to clean water is a huge issue. And so that's something that we have to think about when you talk about environmental injustice. Access to basic amenities. I mean, we should have a human right to access to clean air, the clean water, the safe food. So environmental justice as a movement is really talking about, you know, those basic things. It, again, environmental justice is proximal. It's everyday, it's pocketbook, folks. What we need to live and survive. Some people are living in toxic environments where they don't have the, the minimum uh, necessities to order to survive. Now you and you think about these issues of living in a community where they've been exposed to chemical structures like mercury or lead, right? Or particulate matter or PCBs from the from the Warren County example. They're living, they've been exposed to biological stresses like mold mildew allergens, or maybe uh, SARS-CoV-2, you know, viruses or pathogens like cryptosporidium, or you know, bacteria like E. coli, depending on where they're living. Uh, physical stressors, night, uh, light pollution, noise pollution, heat. Heat is an EJ issue. You have so many people who live in urban communities because of redlining, where it has too much concrete and asphalt, whether it be the roadways that are built in their neighborhoods or the buildings that they, that they live in, right, made out of concrete, absorbing too much heat, right? You have the albedo effect. You have an urban heat island. They don't have tree canopy because the trees were knocked down. You know, trees are good for all kinds of things. Noise pollution mitigation, air pollution mitigation, heat mitigation, right? Stormwater management, playability for your mental health and for food. You don't have, having access to trees is an EJ issue. And then don't have air conditioning. Of course, from climate change perspective, you know, ACs are, if you're depending on the source power, problematic in, in, in emitting greenhouse gases. But heat, you know, heat is a big issue. Then you got the, then you have the psychosocial stressors. So think about the cumulative impact on folks who live in communities with EJ issues. It's a, it's a, it's, they're dealing with the intersection of exposure to numerous stressors. So the burden of being near these hazards leads to exposure disparities, leads to risk disparities, which leads to health disparities. So you think about exposure to things like, you know, lead and mercury. You know, I like, one of my risks is, how are you gonna put a America first, you're gonna put your kids first. The fact that we have so many kids living in housing with lead paint or drinking uh, water that may have lead contamination or in schools that may have lead in the water. The fact that they may be living in an area that maybe near lead smelter, or maybe some, you know, some residual lead from previous uses. That's a problem. Uh, think about communities, again, these highways and byways I talked about before. The fact that you have a highway going through your community, for those of you, you think about LA, some neighborhoods, four, six, eight lane highways, uh, other parts of California, you know, other, you know, coming back to the you know, East Coast, Washington, DC, or going to Atlanta, all the, you know, all the 85s in Atlanta, and they go through those neighborhoods. Think about the fact that, you know, the community members, they are, they are internalized those, those externalities. So we're basically absorbing those toxicants. So for example, particular matter is one toxicant, what does it do to you? PM 2.5, 2.5 microns, right, in diameter. When you breathe that in, it causes the asthma, asthma attacks, it causes heart disease, it causes strokes, it elevates your blood pressure, it can cause Alzheimer's, diabetes, increased infant mortality rates, birth defects, low birth weight babies, cause cancer, it can also uh, lead to premature mortality 
it decreased life expectancy. So that's just one combustion byproduct when you, when you combust fossil fuels. And again, think about all those cars, all the buses, all the trucks going through neighborhoods. Think about the folks uh, who live near the ports in California, right? Whether it be Port of LA, San Diego, uh, Port of Oakland, those communities, they've been exposed to a lot of combustion byproducts, which can lead to a, num a, a number of health outcomes. Now, in my work as a scientist, you know, one of the things I really try to do is to do, um, one of the things I try to do is to do community engaged um, research. And, you know, the reason why it's important, you know, this, this comes from, you know, one of my, so I had two primary mentors as a, as a grad student at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, uh, one was uh, Dr. Steve Wing, who's a good friend of Dr. Richardson. Uh, who unfortunately um, passed away five years ago, what was it, a couple weeks anniversary, five years ago. Uh, he was known as the People's Professor. And Dr. Wing was all about, you know, doing rigorous science, but engaging those communities who are most impacted by the problem. We call him the People's Professor for a reason, because he's doing science for the people, okay? Science for the people. If you look at look at my, I mean, you know, let me just slow down a little bit. He was doing science for the people. So he thought about when you did science, you want to engage those who are most impacted because you get the you get the best questions, develop the best study design, to get the best data, to get the, the you know get the best results, and then use that for action. Um, so if you don't know Dr. Steve Wing, um, look up his work i wouldn't be the researcher the scholar the activist that i am today without his mentorship and his guidance and so when you coming back to this this continuum as you move from left to right trust involvement communication increases in the work so for me if you want to do community engaged work, you want to be doing participatory research in this fourth panel or community driven research. And it's all about partnerships, all about relationships, right? And so, and the CDPR, as I was just saying, communities engage in all stages of the research process. And, and you think about it this way I, yes, I'm a scientist, right? I'm a credential scientist. I'm going to get to that point. I'm a credential scientist. But if you want to not have general knowledge, I don't live in the EJ community. The folks who live in communities with EJ issues are have what we call specificatory knowledge. So I have general knowledge. They have specificatory knowledge, right? One of my community mentors, uh, Dr. Benjamin McLean, who, who, who works, who uh, directs Harami House in Savannah, Georgia, Shikobi, the folks at the front line are true subject matter experts. So we should be engaging them in the research. So CBPR, uh, Grounded and Paulo Ferrer's Pedagogy of the Press, right? Speaking truth to power through science, folks. The idea is communities engaged in all stages of the process. You want to value and uplift the contextual knowledge, the community uh, 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 and cultural knowledge systems, okay? To, to translate their research to action. I used to be on the board of CCPH, Community Campus Partnership Health, and they talk about the principles of partnership. So, you know, you want to have authentic partnerships, transformative partnerships, quality processes, meaningful outcomes. So what is quality processes and making sure you listen to the community's voice, that they're engaged in all stages of the process, transformative experiences to make sure you have, you are transformed as a scientist, as a researcher, as an advocate, right? You have community transformation. It's just not good enough to study the problem. What did you do to solve the problem? We have enough research. We have billions of dollars of funding out there. Studying the problem over and over again. That is extractive. That is colonial. And that is what I call pain pipping science. We just, we just study the problem. What are you actually going to solve the problem? And, and then get to those meaningful outcomes. Did you it, clean the air, clean the water, get people access to safe, affordable housing? Right? Did you reduce the hazard? Did you reduce exposure? Did you build capacity? That's what we want to see. You know, in, in my work with my center, I'm calling a center now. We 
we, 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 with a center for community engagement and environmental health, we do empowerment signs. My team, we do liberation signs. We're empowering folks through science to get science and scientific tools in the hands of the people. Science is, is a means to an end, not an end, right? We're talking about science is about action, less about extraction. Science is about what's more what's, what's right with you than what's wrong with you. I think a lot of public health science has been polluted by the biomedical model, where we always focus on reduction of approaches of what's finding out mechanisms and what's wrong with this. Man, clean the air, clean the water, give people access to safe housing, safe food. How your science, your science getting to that? Reduction of science gets us away from holistic solutions. It gets us away from upstream determinants. It gets us away from the root causes. It, it gets more into this, this, this science ocracy, this data ocracy. We gotta have more data, more data, and more data, and more data. How much data do we need before we act? This the question, so what? What are you doing with that data? What are you doing for the information? So part of my job, and you know, what I do today, I, I kind of focus on DEI science, diversity, equity, inclusion science. Dr. Richardson mentioned I'm, I'm on the um, um, National Academy of Science Board of Environmental Studies and Toxicology Best. I'm also a member of the, the Board of the Citizen Science Association. I'm a new member of the EPA Science Advisory Board. I just graduated off of NEJAC uh, as of a few months ago. Now I'm a new member of the Science Advisory Board. They, they finally have an EJ subcommittee, so I'll be a member of the EJ subcommittee. But a lot of my discussions about changing the culture of science, uh, bringing a DEI emphasis to science, and bringing and doing justice-focused science, justice, you know, justice-driven science, right? Where we're trying to achieve social, racial, economic, political and health justice. And so if you don't know Boyer, please look him up. Boyer talks about the five dimensions of science. And Boyer talks about the scholarship of inquiry. That's the one where we talk a lot about studying problems, knowledge production. That's the one I think that's over, over emphasized or over commodified in academia. The scholarship of integration, that's transdisciplinary. Think about the problem as a mountain. I got my one little pack, pickaxe, right? Environmental health. Well. This is a huge mountain. I need more disciplines to help me out. So you need geography, you need anthropology, you need sociology, right? You need political science, you need policy, you need environmental science, okay? You need epidemiology, you need biostatistics. You need multiple disciplines working together to build up the data that then translate the data to action, okay? It's the science of teaching, the science of engagement, the science of application. I tell my colleagues and students, well, you're not doing all five dimensions doing incomplete science. When you say, Jacoby, it's not my, it's not my job to translate data, research to action. You, that's a political decision that you made. I'm a, as I said before, I think I said before, I came from community with EJ issues, right? Maybe not EJ issues, but they have a you know landfill, uh, a you know a sewage treatment plant, a large highway, you know, the ingredients. But I never thought of it as environmental justice as a kid. I just recognized as an adult, like man, that was some you know exposures, uh, uh, things I was exposed to near my house and near my neighborhood. But I think for us to move forward with science. We have to make sure we're, we're doing all five dimensions. We have to value application science. We uh, applied action-oriented science. And, you know, in my signature, I have the people's money should be used to do the people's research and to complete that quote to get to the people's solutions. We have to move away from doing extractive helicopter science. Uh, there's an article that came out, I think, um, maybe in JAMA or one of those uh, journals a few months ago, uh, maybe about five weeks ago, that talked about health equity tourism and how a lot of folks are doing health equity research. They're just studying the problem. They're not doing anything about it. So that's the same thing for environmental justice. You, you can't be studying the problem, folks, and not doing anything about it. You said, what should come again? As I said earlier, Dr. Wilson, well, you know, that's my, this is my choice. Now, let me say this to y'all. And someone say, Dr. Wilson, oh my God, you're very passionate about these issues. You're saying a little bias. <laughs> Is. I'm sorry, everyone is biased. There's no objective scientist. You could have grown up near a butterfly farm and not do butterfly research. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a positive bias. Your lived experiences inform the work that you do. So you come to academia to get a PhD so you can go back to be part of the fabric of change. That's important. That should be valued. That should be acknowledged. That should be supported. That should be uplifted, right? Unfortunately, a lot of times when you come to academia, when you come in, want to get these skills so you can go back and solve problems, they want to take away your culture. Then the culture wellness gets removed. They will take away your lens and your lived experience. No, I say, 
Know your why. Why did you come in and get this pitch in the first place? And let that why be what drives you. Let the, 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 the energy, the, 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 the connection to your communities be what drives you. The connection to the effect of change be what drives you, right? And then someone may say, well, Dr. Wilson, you know, I just, my job back then is just to just publish it. You know, let me tell y'all students, publishing, that's fine. Publish a parish if you're being in academia. But let me say this to you in the, in the words of the great Yoda. Peer review publications does not science communication make. I'm gonna say it again. Peer review publications does not science communication make. Just because you're publishing a journal doesn't mean it's actually impacting change. One of my community mentors will make a most is called publications, toilet paper. What is toilet paper good for? Let me stop y'all. Y'all get what I'm saying? What he's saying is, how are you addressing the problems to your science? How are you communicating with those who are decision makers, who are policy makers? How are you making sure your science, you're sharing it in a 15 second, 30 second uh, elevator speech, right? So what you should be doing to impact change, and this is what I do in my science, you know, empowerment science, liberation science, you know, I do fact sheets, I do infographics, I do a lot of mapping, I'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. I do a lot of mapping, you know, I do newspaper, I do radio, I do television, right? I do blogs, I do white papers, or I may have already said that, white papers, you know, we try to do uh, 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 Facebook, we do Instagram, and we do TikTok, and get the information, the science to the people in the way they, they want to receive it. Know your audience, simply stated, right? Simply put, know your audience. So academia over commodifies inquiry and over commodifies peer review publications, but those peer review publications, unless you're making a walk and talk to that policymaker, are not going to impact policy, impact change, and get to social justice. Okay, so you have to be in the game to make that happen. You got to be able to communicate science effectively. National Academy of Sciences actually has a science communication uh, work group, and so. And then also for those you're going to be in academia, maybe you will, but maybe you won't. We have to change the culture of academia so it actually values these other ways to present scientific results. Okay. Because even if you get published in a peer-reviewed uh, high-impact factor journal, um, if those of you are uh, publishing now, is that actual impact? I see that as talking to your peer crowd will. Doesn't mean you're actually impacting the issue. Impact again means did you clean the air? Did you clean the water? Did you give people access to safe food and water? Did you increase the access to affordable housing and safe housing? Did you reduce the hazard? Did you reduce exposures? Did you did you address health disparities? Did you achieve health equity? Did you build capacity? Right? Did you shut down an incinerator like we did? Have you given people access to transform brownfields like it, like we've done? How do you start permitting processes to expand coal-fired power plants and, and, and landfills or concrete plants like we've done? That's impact. That's what you should be striving for. Real change. So when you're working with communities, what are the issues, the impacts, the opportunities? Know your why. Be transparent with your why with the communities. You may want to work on a particular topic. They may not want to, but be transparent and build that relationship again. When you build relationships are the uh, foundation of partnerships. So you want to have, you know, openness, communication, right? You want to have trust. You want to have some Aretha Franklin. You got to have that respect, okay? Those are the building blocks of good partnerships. And then any issue you work on, you could, just like any issue, you should be able to connect to one of five things, food, faith, family, health, and jobs. Again, making environmental justice proximal with everyday pocketbook, connecting to people's everyday needs. That's what, that's how you're going to, that's how we're going to solve these problems. Now, also, even the issue of climate change, right? You think about climate change, you know, if you look at some of the research, and you know this both globally and in the U.S. context, those who, uh, you know, release fewer greenhouse gases or are, are, are consuming less are impacted more by climate change. Uh, look at it in the U.S. context. Uh, the folks that are overburdened by environmental injustice, right, dealing with environmental injustice, they're the same ones that have differential climate risk. They're the ones that hit first, mo uh, most, and the worst when it comes to climate change, whether it be climate related perturbations, whether it be fires, uh, whether it be hurricanes, whether it be floods, you know, whether it be heat waves, remember heat waves are held for the poor and the elderly, uh, uh, whether it be um, uh, other uh, climate related acts, events, right? Uh, both the direct and indirect effects of climate change, there's differential climate risks. You can see that with Hurricane Katrina. Think, think about the irony, y'all, at, at, for New Orleans. 16 years after Katrina hit, Ida hit. And you saw what happened to the Gulf Coast region, right? Last year was the most named storms, the history named storms in the Gulf Coast, seven named storms, right? And then you saw what Ida did to New York, New Jersey. So the front end of Ida, what it did to the Gulf Coast of New Orleans. 
and then back in the Ida, what happened, unfortunately, in New York, New Jersey. Low income folks, economically socially vulnerable people, are differently have differential climate risks compared to their wealthier, you know, uh, counterparts who may be more in communities that have more inf better resilient infrastructure. We have to address inequities in our preparedness to climate change, and response to climate change, and, and recovery to climate change for these populations who, at the same time, are dealing with environmental injustice. You know, one of the things we also do is community science, citizen science. Uh, it's another way to democratize access to, to the science. Um, and so I just want to share that. That term is not as inclusive. So I am on the board of the Citizen Science Association. We've had a lot of debates about changing the name of the organization. Um, and we actually had a paper in science a few months ago about this debate about moving to, to the term community science, which to me is more justice focused is more in the in the realm of community-based pieces of research, uh, participatory action research, uh, or kind of uh, community-driven research approaches. But I think citizen science is one way to empower folks. The empower, I spell with an I-N, because I had community leaders that told me, Shakobi, you can't give me power, but you can help me connect the power I have, help me actualize my power, help me build my power, help me grow my power. So how do you, again, how do you use science to help people grow their power? Uh, again, science is a, means to an end. It is not an end. And, and communities, we need to be able to get them science, scientific tools, data, data products, they can they can get action, right, on their EJ issues. Now, my my lab, we do a lot of tools. We build a lot of tools. So y'all, since y'all are in California, if you're interested in environmental health, you should have heard of Cal Enviro Screen, which is the oldest kind of state level environmental screening tool. Uh, the national tool is called the US EPA EJ Screen. Uh, there's a new tool been developed as part of the Executive Order 14008, which is the climate, no, the economic climate justice screening tool uh, that's been built by USDS. That's actually meeting tonight at uh, after my lecture at six o'clock. We're going to do a, get a feedback session on on the update on that on that tool. And then you have other state level screening tools. Washington State has its own screening tool. Uh, Michigan is building a tool. Paul Moha, some of you may know Dr. Moha through his his work. Uh, new Jersey has a tool. Um, North Carolina has a tool as part of a, a, a settlement for a administrative complaint, an EJ complaint that Dr. Wing actually submitted on the differential permitting of KFOS, which, which I'll get to in North Carolina. And then we have a tool called Maryland EJ Screen uh, that, that we started building about five years ago. And we're still working to improve the tool. And so it allows you to kind of map different uh, indicators, such as social demographic indicators, you know, hazard indicators. Uh, is at the track level. Our tools at the track level, similar to the Calavaro screen, but the US EPA EJ screen tool is at the block group level. So you can basically map uh, different uh, different indicators in different domains. So we have four buckets, pollution burden exposure, pollution burden environmental effects, uh, sense of populations, and, and social, dem social demographic factors. And then we kind of combine those uh, into a, um, a score. And then we can create like an EJ score at the track level. We're in the process right now of upgrading our tool to make it better to actually have a, a data available at the block group level and also at the legislative district level. So we can map environmental injustice at the block group level, uh, the system track level, and the legislative district level. And we're also bringing in climate change indicators, more climate change indicators into the tool. Uh, and some other, some other, some other kind of gaps are being filled because a lot of the screening tools right now. They're very urban centric. And we're trying to make sure we have balance to bring more rural related indications to our tool. We also help upgrade a park equity mapping tool for the Department of Natural Resources, state of Maryland. So the whole idea is, you know, making sure we can kind of capture uh, who has access to green space, you know, parks specifically, but who has access to parks and who does not in the state of Maryland. And again, think about uh, access to natural infrastructure. I talked before about disparities in access to uh, natural infrastructure to, you know, to, to access to nature. Um, you know, so this tool has a different set of indicators and in it compared to the GIS map, the uh, EJ screen tool. So we have park distance, population density, income, uh, linguistic isolation. And we create a, again, we create a score and we can map this and show a chloroplast map, basically color changes. And so you can see areas that have uh, greater access to parks compared to areas that, 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 that have less access to parks. And then you can figure the areas that have less access to the parks, 
parks, you, you can find ways to improve access, bring in more green space. Because again, all the benefits that green space provides uh, to communities, I mean, this is one way that will make communities, you know, as it relates to mitigating climate change, having more green space is, a, is an important part of that. Now, in my dissertation work in, 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 in North Carolina, um, so I was a grad student at UNC Chapel Hill from 1998 to 2005. I did my master's and my PhD. Um, so I did work on uh, my master's degree. I mapped, I looked at environmental justice issues associated with, with the Mississippi hog industry. So I'm from the state of Mississippi. Um, I don't hear my accent, but the missus who's from New York says, yeah, you're, you're from Mississippi. I can hear it. So y'all may hear my Mississippi accent a little bit. Um, and then my dissertation was on uh, looking at atmospheric ammonia levels near industrial hog farms and uh, human receptor sites uh, in eastern North Carolina. And, and so the issue of hog farms is, is still a big issue in North Carolina. Um, there, there are a, a numerous number, numerous hog farms, industrial hog farms, we call it concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, CAFOs in North Carolina. Most of them are in the eastern uh, hydrophysiologic plane of the state. Um, Dr. Wing, as I said before, was, you know, the main reason I started doing work um, on, on this as part of my dissertation. He, he had a project called CHEHO, which is funded by National Institute of Vermont Health Sciences, who was doing work, you know, with community-based organizations to um, look at environmental justice and health issues, health issues associated with living near these operations. Um, you know, I was introduced to, to uh, the issue of industrial hog farms. I think back in 1999 with Dr. Wing, when we attended the, I think the 1999 North Carolina Environmental Justice Summit, uh, community-based EJ Summit, and we went to Tillery, North Carolina. Tillery is a freedman's uh, school area uh, that was founded by United Church of Christ, I, I believe correctly. Uh, at uh, um, So it was um, at Bricks. So the Franklin Center at Bricks is where the summit was. I may have misstated that. But the Franklin Center at Bricks was a facility, a uh, UCC facility uh, to, to educate freedmen. Uh, but was in Tillery, North Carolina. And so was introduced to uh, the issues of industrial hog farms, I believe at that, at that, uh, at that uh, summit. And uh, some of the, our cohort who attended that event, including Chris Heaney, who's now uh, associate professor at Hopkins, uh, we came back from the summit like, oh man, Dr. Wing, we should really have a class on these EJ issues. And so we worked that semester. I think we worked that after we came back from the, the uh, it was always in the fall, always the third weekend of October. So I think we came back from that event in 1999. We worked on the syllabus. And either we had the, we, we took the class in the spring of 2000, or we took the class in fall of 2000. I don't remember, but he, we basically worked with Dr. Wing to create a syllabus for this class. And it was a community based sort of environmental justice and epidemiology class where um, community members came in and talk about the EJ issues, and we learned about environmental justice, we connected to environmental health, we connected to epidemiology. It's probably one of my favorite classes, because of course I helped to create the syllabus for the class, so I would be one of the first cohort to take the class. But yeah, I've actually modeled a lot of the EJ, EJ classes I teach now to both undergrad and grad students um, from that class, from that experience with Dr. Wing. And so, you know, I think what's really important about his work, again, I call, call the people's professor, this really, you know, engaging students. He really provided opportunities for students to step up and, and work with communities. Um, he was really helpful for me because um, I didn't really have a lot of great mentors at UNC Chapel Hill. And, and he actually wasn't in my department. I was in environmental science and engineering. Dr. Wing was in uh, epidemiology. And so he was on my committee. He wasn't a chair of my dissertation committee. But I saw him as my primary sort of mentor because he was just mentoring me as a scholar. He was probably mentoring to me as a person, you know, as as a as a you know as a young man and and, and someone who who was looking uh, at my overall growth and my overall development and my overall support. And actually, since Dr. Wings, uh, not just passing. Um, well, since Dr. Wing's passing and before his passing, you know, being in academia after I graduated from UNC and went to other institutions, I haven't had a, I haven't had a mentor since. 
um, and academia who 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 really met, who meets my criteria. So for those of you uh, who want to, you know, go into academia or want to do research, find a mentor. It's not just going to be mentoring you, you know, from a discipline perspective. Your discipline ways was the environmental health or something else, or a research perspective. But someone's going to mentor you. The whole person mentoring, right? That's why I got from Dr. Wing. Whole person mentoring. He was just not again interested in me as a as a researcher, but really my overall development, and, and was very supportive in that way. So you had these industrial hog farms in North Carolina. Um, this is a map that Dr. Wing created, and you know, and it shows you just the connections between, you know, history with the past as prologue, right? As you can see, the places where they have a lot of these industrial hog operations, you see the relationship between. Uh, areas that had a lot of enslaved Africans. And so you can see the, you know, the areas that are permitted, folks are descendants of those enslaved Africans, right? You see a high percentage of people of color, Black folk, living in these operations. These operations weren't there before the people were there. These are people who were there before the operations were there, right? But it shows you how, you know, our, again, our policies, in this case, agricultural policies, how they can be deemed racist because these facilities a primary located where you got more folks of color. And the centers of those folks of color, black folk. So why are these cables an issue? Because of the waste that's produced, uh, because of the impact on human health. You got the, the houses that the hogs are in and the, the fans that blow off the waste. You got the lagoons that you that you see. Uh, where they hold the waste is basically like cesspools, open toilets that don't flush. Um, an adult hog produces four times the amount of waste that an adult human does, but right now we don't treat their waste. We put the waste in the hole in the ground. And you also have an issue, now we have this issue of biogas facilities. Now they want to capture the methane. So it's going to lead to entrenchment of these industries. Instead of getting rid of the industry, companies don't want these lagoons. They don't want these farms. Instead of getting rid of the industry, what, it, what is now going to lead to entrenchment is, well, one way we address climate change, Dr. Wilson, is we have to capture the methane from these facilities. You know what you could do? Get rid of the facilities, <laughs> right? Let's go back to regenerative, sustainable agriculture. Or, or okay, if you're not going to get rid of the facilities, treat the waste in the same way we treat human waste. So you want to have the emission of volatile organic compounds, particular matter, right? Other uh, uh, ammonia, other nitrogenous compounds, hydrogen sulfides, other sulfurous compounds that impact air quality, right? And or, or the runoff from the lagoons, or when is a rain event, when is a hurricane, they they spray that waste on the ground and you have runoff because most of the folks who are in rural areas, they're in what? They're on well water. So yeah, issue with pathogens and, and you know, nitrates, et cetera, that, that can contaminate the well water. So you have these environmental impacts that are important. So I'm not, I mean, so just want to share what you want. This is the issue, one of the main issues that I worked on as a grad student. It's still a huge issue in, in North Carolina. And Dr. Wing and others did a lot of research uh, looking at the health impacts, um, increasing mood disorders, uh, increasing fatigue, uh, it have it impacts the immune functioning, uh, increasing the asthma for those who live in these operations. But even with all this information, the industry is still alive and well in North Carolina. They're still using the lagoon system. And, and now with this advent or this investments in biogas facilities, this, this industry, I think, is not going away. Unfortunately, unless some rules are made uh, that really can focus on investing more in family farming and folks on investing, uh, making these systems closed systems. So right now, these because of right to farm laws, many of these operations, they, they can pollute with, uh, you know, without any real caps. Right. They're not really regulated by the Clean Air Act like it should be, the Substance Control, Substance Control Act like it should be. Toxic Release Inventory, which is part of EPRA, Emergency Planning Community Ranking no Act, as they should be. Some have to get NPDES permit, y'all know, NIPDES permit, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit under the Clean Water Act, but that's not enough. So more needs to be done to regulate this industry and the same way we regulate other industries, whether it be power plants, whether it be landfills, whether it be sewage treatment plants. These, this, is a, this is an industry. And they're producing industrial level waste, so they should be they should be uh, regulated accordingly. Dr. Wilson, I'm oh, wondering yes. if we could if we could transition to questions in the next few minutes, just so we have a few minutes for the students to and others. Oh yes, yes. Them. Sorry, sorry. I, yeah. I got too much into my slides. Sorry about that. So, so a couple more slides. So, 
So with the issue, so you have these hog farms, right? But then you have hurricanes. Okay, so look what happened. This is a hurricane that hit in 1999. Look what happened. Uh, these animals were drowned. And you think about all the waste and people had to wade through a toxic soup of animal waste and maybe human waste too from the septic tanks, right? So this is a problem when it comes to climate change. So not just the emissions, but because of climate-related disasters, you, you have a big rain event or you know a hurricane come through, then you're going to have this, this constant issues with this industry having impacts on uh, local rivers and streams and also on, on human health. And then you had Hurricane Florence that hit a few years ago, well, maybe like four years ago now. Is it four years ago, Dr. Richardson, five years ago now? Uh, and, you see the, and you see the same thing that happened. So um, let me just end, I'm going to end this. Give me a couple more seconds. So my other main mentor, I want to give him a shout out, is, is Omega Wilson. So I had one main community, uh, uh, um, academic mentor, Dr. Wing, and then I had one main community mentor, Omega Wilson. So basically, Omega's with the West End Revitalization Association. They were going to have a highway that would be built through their neighborhoods, uh, 119 bypass. Actually, the highway did get built, but they fought against it for years. They didn't have access to sewer and water infrastructure. The sewer and water lines ran through the neighborhoods, but they weren't connected. And they hosted sewer street plant. These are what we call Freeman's communities. No, like I, you heard me use the term Freeman before. These communities were founded after slavery. So they had old cemeteries, old uh, churches, black churches, which are going to be basically built over. Uh, so don't care about your living, don't care about your dead by this, by this roadway. They came with this, their own framework called Community Owned Men's Research. Dr. Wing was one of the academic partners on this project. Uh, Chris Haney, who again is Ed Hopkins. Uh, um, uh, one of my other colleagues um, worked on it. John, he's now uh, at, at Texas A&M. He was in planning. We all worked as students on this project. But uh, the community group came with this, that, that this framework, Community Owned Men's Research. So they can, this is like community science in, in its purest form, in my opinion. The research of other community for the community, by the community. And it is, it's science for compliance. So not just studying stuff to study it, right? But actually making sure that they're, they're complying with laws and regulations from Title VI of the Rights Act, from environmental laws and regulations, building codes, et cetera. And, and Chris and I and, and Omega came with this, this whole idea of legal epidemiology. So some of you may know that this, you know, epi, you got to look at it, exposed disease uh, uh, relationships and look at causality. We want to get stuck in the causality trap. Think about all the pollutants people are exposed to, all the stress they've been exposed to. All right, science is not keeping up with exposure and, and, and health issues that people are experiencing. So we want to focus more on, again, understand exposure and leverage and exposure data to, to, to seek action, basically. And so we train community members to collect their own water samples. So based as community scientists, we saw high rates of such system failure. We saw E. coli, other uh, kind of indicators of, uh, 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 of, fecal, of fecal pollution, fecal contamination. And able to use this to delay this work, to delay the bypass from being built. For, for some years, but it was eventually built, but they but they were able to negotiate to get the bypass to the highway to, to go around the black communities and not you know destroy the, the, the cemeteries and grave uh, cemeteries and churches. And we we're able to also get these communities first time installation of sewer water infrastructure. So we're gonna talk about those basic amenities from before. So I got I'm out of time. I have way too many slides, and I thank you for the time and I'll take some questions. And thanks for uh, coming in there uh, to get me to the Q&A. Thank you so much. That, that was wonderful and uh, inspiring work. Um, uh, in, in terms of Q&A, um, if there are uh, students who you can either type your question into the Q&A box um, or feel free to um, turn on, I believe, um, and, and and ask a question verbally, which would be very nice as well. Yeah, I see, David, I see one question in the chat. I'll answer real quick. Yeah, Forest Ecology, I think you're in a good place to transition because of the climate change, climate change, environmental health, and green infrastructure. So how can we transform our cities into ecotopias, right? Remove the concrete, remove the ice fall, bring in more urban forestry, right? That is a solution when it comes to, remember, trees are good for noise pollution mitigation, heat mitigation, air pollution mitigation, and stormwater management. Those are, think about the whole food, energy, water nexus. You're actually well prepared to, to transition into, into environmental health because of your background in forest ecology, because of climate change. So I think, I think, you, I think it, should, it, may be a, it shouldn't be a difficult transition. Other questions? And uh, if there's a host who can allow everybody to um, to talk, um, that would be great. I'm not quite sure how to do that here, but uh, it's completely fine to. 
Oh, another one in Q and in the Q and A. Oh yes, great question. Second question. Um, oh, I see the third question too. Yeah, that's a great question too as well. Yeah, it's hard doing work with communities. I mean, I just had some issues that happened recently around funding. It's hard doing. It's hard doing work with real people. Like, make sense. This room with lab work. When you're actually working with people, you work with people. People. You get it? I mean, y'all know how this is just being around people. It's just like everyday relationships. How you take that into working with communities. And, and I think in your question about trust, particularly when you have academic institutions where they have a lot of baggage, and this is what I talk about extractive science. I mean, if you're not doing stuff to actually solve the problems, you, you, you're never going to build trust. And you actually have to show up as a researcher when it's not related to your research question. So a lot of my research actually over time, I don't have a research agenda per se. My research has been informed by community need. Usually what happens is there's a community uh, that has an EJ issue or environmental issue. They don't come to me directly because they they they're they not as connected to the academic institution because of the whole town gallon divide, the Ivory Tower issue. So usually they talk to an environmental group and say, well, you should talk to Dr. Wilson. And so I provide a little technical assistance and then we, we build a relationship from there. Okay, we build a relationship from there. And so, but you have to build that trust. You have to show up all the time show up when it's not your research priority and provide technical assistance on issues that may not be your area of interest. So that's why it's important as researchers to actually bring skills. It's not about your, your discipline. It's about the skills that you bring to the table. Your research skills, your communication skills, your grant writing skills, your advocacy skills. Communities need skills, okay? That's what's important. How you deal with climate doom? It's interesting. Uh, I think the doom and gloom is problematic. Like the world's going to end, uh, the sky's falling. Communities with EJ issues are already dealing with doom. You got to frame it differently. You got to talk about climate change as an opportunity, the climate economy. You got to talk about EJ, the EJ movement is about hope, right? Our shared humanity. So you got to reframe this fight about climate change and the struggle, for, uh, struggle to, to, to solve climate change. And doom and gloom is not going to work because they're already people are already dying who live in communities with EJ issues. So adding on top of that, dumping you know adding you know I'm gonna use a proverbial dumping on them about that is not helpful. Talk more about it from an opportunity perspective. Uh, remember, EJ is just not about the environment, environmental justice. It's also about economic justice. So bring an EJ frame, an economic justice frame to the work, and I think. For those of you who may be familiar with Executive Order 14008, that's a Justice 40 uh, of the Executive Order. As we move from a dirty economy to a clean energy economy, 40% of those benefits should go to disadvantaged communities. Take that. How can we transform communities? Remember, I talk about transformative. How can we transform communities and create opportunity? Okay. Oh, thank you for that next question. Uh, call session with various mitigation. Uh, look at the uh, Justice 40 initiative I just said. Uh, it's part of um, Executive Order 14008. Of course, the infrastructure bill that just passed uh, last week, I think it was last week. That's another place. That's a, there, there, there are a number of dollars for EVs, public transit, uh, dealing with um, legacy pollution. The legacy pollution dollars, uh, I think the EPA got an extra 50 or $60 billion, something like that. So look to get those dollars to your region, your regional office of the EPA and also from the state agency. So it'll be Cal EPA, also Cal Environmental, Cal Health will be uh, agencies to look at in the state of California. Oh, I, I think working with interdisciplinary research change is really, really important. Uh, most of the people, most of the work I do is interdisciplinary and, and, and you can't do it by yourself. So I, so I think you wanna be able to always work. I do a lot of GIS. so. Work for, I work with geographers. Uh, also, um, I think it's important to work with, I'm not an epidemiologist, so you wanna work with epidemiologists, but I also think you wanna work with planners. I think the key, a lot of keys, uh, the keys to addressing environmental injustice is around planning. Planning, planning, planning. So have geography, planning, epi, environmental health, uh, maybe a little bit of sociology, that's a winning combination. Um. Dr. Wilson, I, I think we should stop there because it's we've hit our time, but I just want to say uh, thank you so much. And uh, you introduced a, a whole series of terms, uh, liberation yeah. science, justice-driven science, legal epidemiology. 
um, which I'm going to carry with me. So thank you for those gifts. And uh, thank you everybody very much for the uh, your time today. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Y'all have a good holiday week. Stay safe. Thanks. Goodbye.